I'd like to use physics to study an example of interacting objects that's going to involve a number of different topics like friction and tension, Newton's laws, uh, all put together in one problem. In particular, in this problem, I have a block of mass big M that is sitting on a slope, a slope 30 degrees from horizontal, and it's connected by a massless rope over a massless frictionless pulley to a hanging mass, little m, that's hanging in freely in space. And the slope and the block on it have a coefficient of static friction of 0 0.53. And I'm going to specify that the mass of the big block is three times the mass of the little block. I won't tell you exactly what they are. We're going to hope it cancels out. But, I, but that's our setup. And my question is, in this system, is the block going to slip? Will this static friction keep it from slipping, or is it going to slip? That's our question. And uh, to do that, static friction problems, there, there are some that are find the maximum this or the minimum that. This isn't that kind. This is the does it slip type of question. And for those, we have a consistent strategy. Step one, we're going to assume, tentatively, that there's no slip, that it doesn't slip at all. We're going to tentatively assume that it doesn't slip. Step two is we're going to calculate the necessary static friction force, force of static friction, to prevent it from slipping. And then step three, we're going to check the equation, or we have an empirical equation for static friction that says that the magnitude of the force of static friction has to be less than or equal to mu s, the static friction co coefficient, times the magnitude of the associated normal force. So that's our plan. We're going to do these three steps, and we're going to solve this problem and see whether or not it slips. If it does, then we'll know if the, if the force we need to keep it from slipping is greater than this constant, than this product, that means we'll know that it's going to slip. All right, so how do we do this? Well, it's a force problem. And it's a force problem with two separate pieces, two systems here. And that tells me I want to draw free body diagrams for these systems. So the first one for the little m, uh, I, I draw a dotted line around my system, my little m system, to separate it from its environment. And I look at it. I say there's one contact point. It's the tension force up above. So in the notation of the textbook I'm using these days, uh, for, for the here's the free body diagram for little m. Uh, in that notation, that tension force is going to be represented by force of tension, F sub t. Uh, and I'm going to say F sub t, I'll say t on the little m, t comma little m, just to indicate the force of tension on that little mass. That's the only contact point with the outside world on this little m. So then I think about long-range forces, and of course there is one. There's the force of gravity, force of gravity, again, on the little m mass pulling downward. Those are the only two forces that I can see on this uh, on this mass. And so I've got that. Well, after I draw my free body diagram, next to my free body diagram, I always draw a little acceleration arrow. And here I have sort of a guess to make. I don't know which way this is going to go. I'm, I'm picturing this going down, gravity pulling the system down, and this hanging mass pulling the big mass up the slope. So I'm going to make that tentative assumption. Remember, you can make a guess. I, it could be wrong. I know it's got, not going to go left or right. It's going to be vertical up or down. So I'm just going to guess that this is going to go down. So this is my acceleration of the little mass is a downward vector over there. And having drawn those, it's pretty clear to me that a good choice of coordinates for this free body diagram is going to be standard coordinates, just vertical coordinates. And uh, again, the convention in the book that I've been using lately is for vertical, vertically upward to be the plus z direction. So I'm going to stick with that. You, could, you, you can call it anything you want. Call it Bob. Well, don't call it X, Y, or Z, but call it something you want. Uh, vertically upward lines up with all these forces, lines up with the acceleration especially, so that's a good choice. All right, next, my other piece of the story is my big M, my mass over here. And again, I'm going to draw a dotted line around that system to separate it from its environment. And I'm going to draw a free body diagram, free body diagram for the big M system. And here, I'm going to go around and look for places where the outside world touches the system. Well, the rope comes in here, so I know I'm going to have a tension force, tension force on the big mass, I'll call it, here, going up and to the left. 
And then the other contact point is this contact point here, the surface. Anytime two surfaces press together, I know there's a normal force between them. So I know there's going to be a normal force here uh, acting on this big block. So I've got that piece. This is my notation for the book we're using these days, and notations here. And um, anytime I write a normal force, I have to ask, is there a friction force associated with that normal force? And, well, yeah, it, we're, we've got a coefficient of static friction. Our whole point is that. So which way should I draw it? Should I draw it? It's got to be along the slope somewhere. And I've been assuming that my little mass is going to try to accelerate downward. Actually, what am I saying? I'm not accelerating downward. I take that back. I'm assuming it's static, right? I'm assuming it's static, so my acceleration equals zero. Correction, uh, my acceleration should be zero because I'm assuming that it's not slipping, so it's not moving. Uh, so, uh, but I was, in, in my assumed story, what I was getting at making that assumption was, I was assuming the mass was trying to go down, that if there worked friction, it would go down, and so this would be pulled up. And so if this is being pulled up, I'm going to draw my force of static friction along the slope, perpendicular to the normal force, along the slope downward. Uh, again, that's a guess. It could go the other way, but we have to guess something, and we, we know it's going to be along the slope, so we're going to put that in. If we, if we guess wrong, the equations will tell us in the end. We'll, we'll get a nice, easy to understand uh, signal in our equations if we guessed wrong. Finally, those are the only contact forces, but again, long-range forces, gravity. Gravity acts here, and I've got a force of gravity on the big mass going straight down, because that's what down means. Okay, so here I've drawn this. I know, again, correcting myself from earlier, my acceleration equals zero. Acceleration of my big mass equals zero. Uh, acceleration is zero because we're assuming it doesn't slip. And so I'm supposed to choose coordinates now, and that means I've got to think about this. My priority, and this is a more complicated diagram. There are forces in all sorts of different directions. My priorities in choosing a uh, coordinate system are, in general, I want to line up with the acceleration vector if there is one. There's not, so I won't line up with that. Second priority for choosing coordinates is to line up with unknown forces, especially things like the normal force, that can adapt their strength to be anything they need to. Uh, those are obnoxious to deal with in your equations. You want to separate them out. So I'm going to line up with my normal force, line up my coordinates, and I'm going to choose tilted coordinates. Uh, I will have my x-coordinate going along the slope, and again, uh, we're doing x horizontal, z vertical, and we're tilting that, so I'll have the z-coordinate for this one going upward, or uh, going perpendicular along the normal force. Those are supposed to be perpendicular. They don't really look perpendicular, do they? Oh, well, um, that was too far down. Uh, not that this is the important part. x. Okay, that's it. And so a lot of times I like to draw little dotted lines on my free body diagram representing the coordinates I've chosen. And by the way, you may be saying, but wait, you chose different coordinates in the other free body diagram. And my answer is, cool. You're allowed to do that. Um, you're allowed to choose different coordinates if you want to. And uh, it just, uh, each free body diagram will have its own Newton second laws, its own equations, and you shouldn't try to compare them directly from one to the other, except if they're physical laws that relate them. So this, the reason I've drawn this in is that I want to relate the, I want to know the angles of these forces compared to my coordinate axes. And three of them are directly along my coordinate axes. Good choice, me. And then the other one, gravity, is off at some funny angle. And to figure out what that angle is, I need to label some stuff. So just for instance, this 30 degree angle here, I can copy directly into this diagram. If I call this theta is 30 degrees, there's my theta in this diagram. That's 30 degrees. And so if that's 30 degrees, then this angle, this is a right angle here in my coordinates, so this angle would be 60 degrees, 90 minus theta. And then this angle will also be theta, also be 30 degrees. So I know that. That's, that's going to be a theta angle that's next to my gravitational force vector. And the whole idea of doing this is that I know I'm going to want my gravitational force vector to be the hypotenuse of some right triangle whose legs are along the x and z axes, whose, leg, whose legs are along my coordinates. Well, I've got here a z-axis dotted line going through the tail of my vector. So all I need to do is add an x-axis dotted line through the tip of my vector. 
And suddenly I've got a right triangle that I can use later for doing component stuff. Okay, I've drawn my free body diagrams. Great, great. Free body diagrams are super. And my next step, anytime I've drawn a free body diagram, my next step is always to write down Newton's second law in components. What's that mean for us? Newton's second law in components for us, uh, uh, the notation that I've been using in my class this year uh, is a column vector notation for forces. And I've grown quite fond of it, honestly. Uh, column vector notation. And so in particular, I'm going to just write all these things as three-dimensional vec three vectors. So first, for my first free body diagram, my Newton's second law, let me put this down here, uh, Newton, Newton's second law, uh, it's going to read, the sum of the forces has to equal mass times acceleration. So force tension on the little mass plus force of gravity on the little mass equals mass times acceleration of the little mass, which equals zero because I've got no acceleration. And so in column vector form, my tension force, you can see, is entirely in the plus z direction. And so I'm going to write this as the column vector 0, 0, and then plus magnitude of the tension force on the little mass. This is my convention for doing Newton's second law components. I'm always going to write it in terms of explicit plus or minus signs, in terms of magnitudes of the forces involved, and then if there are sines and cosines necessary, I'll put those in too. Here it's no sines and cosines, it's just straight along the axis. There's that, plus my force of gravity uh, is in the minus z direction, and I know the magnitude of the force of gravity. It's m times the magnitude of the gravitational acceleration vector. Uh, so, uh, and again, Notation I'm using in my book this year has g, magnitude of g, written this way. I actually quite like it because it, it makes it very clear that's a positive number. Uh, so I've got that, and that has to equal 0, which is a column vector, 0, 0, 0. So there we go. I've got, I've got Newton's second law in components for this particular one, for the, for the little mass up on top. I've got that part done. And then I can do the same thing for my big mass down below. Uh, I can do that. I can write down same idea, but this time it's going to be messier, right? I'm going to have my, uh, let's just go around here, my tension force on the big mass plus my normal force. I didn't specify this on the big mass because there's only one of them in the problem. Plus my static friction force plus my gravitational force on the big mass equals big mass times acceleration of the big mass, which is zero. Same deal there. I've got that. I've, I, and again, there's, this isn't supposed to be complicated, right? I'm just copying down the list of the forces. And then for my column vectors in component form, always got to go to component form. Here, it's a little more interesting. My tension force, uh, it's along my negative x direction, right? I've chosen x positive down the hill, so tension force is up the hill. So this is minus magnitude of the tension force on the big mass, 0, 0, plus my normal force is entirely in the plus z direction. So that's 0, 0, plus magnitude of the normal force. My static friction force is, I, my guess at least, is that it's in the plus x direction. So here's a column vector plus force of static friction. Some books use a lowercase f sub s for that, but I'm fine with our books, capital F with subscripts with static friction there. Um, uh, our book uses capital F for every force, which is a consistency that it's kind of nice, so I like that. And finally, the force of gravity. This is the interesting one. Plus, okay, uh, gravity. It's more in the plus x than the minus x direction. It's tilted more plus x. So there's a positive thing here. The magnitude is m times the magnitude of g. That's that 9.8 times my x component. I have to look at this triangle. My x component leg of the right triangle is opposite theta. So Katoa, sine is opposite. So this is times the sine of theta, the sine of my 30 degree angle. There's no y components. If you don't have any y stuff in here, we've chosen x and z as our, as our axes. And 
z is this way. It's in more of the minus z than the plus z direction. So I put a minus down here, the magnitude mg again. And the, uh, the side here, the z component side leg of my right triangle, is adjacent to the theta. So that's cosine of theta. There's my sum of forces, and that has to equal 0, 0, 0. Has to sum up to equal 0. All right, I have written Newton's second law in components at this stage, and it takes up a lot of space. I'm going to just, just come over here and clear some space. Um, I'll leave the question, but uh, <laughs> this isn't very good, is it? I was going to refer back to that. Oh, well, um, we'll come back to it. We'll get there. We'll get there. So remember, well, well I'm going to just copy these down. I'm going to copy down the, the component equations. And you can see in the first one uh, over here, there's only one interesting component equation. And it very quickly just tells me what that tension force has to be. It says that the magnitude of the tension force on the little mass has to equal little mass times the magnitude of g. Uh, this wouldn't be true if it were actually moving up and down, right? If there were a non-zero acceleration over here, the tension would be beating gravity or losing up to gravity or something. If we have it not accelerating, we've got this. So that's nice. Uh, I've got that equation. And then the x equation for my second mass, the x equation I can write down, uh, how do I want to write it? Uh, maybe I'll get everything positive. I'll get my big F, I'll get my force of tension on the other side. Uh, well, no, I'm just going to copy it down. This one, worth writing. Minus the magnitude of the tension on the big mass plus zero plus the magnitude of the static friction force plus M. This is, oh, wow, I didn't catch myself. I made a mistake earlier. Let me fix my mistake. I'm going to fix it in red to show my shame. Uh, this is the big mass is capital M. You never want to forget what mass you're using and just default to writing little m everywhere. This is the big mass. So I should have written the capital M. I would say maybe I should have used subscripts to distinguish or I wouldn't have gotten so confused, but I think I still would have gotten confused. Okay, at least I caught it, right? At least I caught that I shouldn't be using the little m when talking about the big mass. Okay, so here, plus m magnitude of g sine of theta equals zero. And my last equation, my z equation down there, is telling me, and this one again, there are just two things. I'm going to go ahead and bring that to the other side and say the magnitude of the normal force is equal to m magnitude of g cosine theta. That's what I'm going to say. So I've got those equations. Uh, and looking at these, what are my knowns and unknowns in these equations? Well, I have the normal force is an unknown. The tension forces are both unknowns. I'm underlining unknowns just to keep track of which ones they are. And the static friction force is an unknown. Uh, also, I guess my masses are unknowns, but as I alluded to earlier, I'm kind of crossing my fingers that the masses are going to cancel out of this problem. I think the problems that just have gravity and friction going on as their main, as their outside forces, uh, those problems usually you're lucky enough that the masses cancel out. So I'm crossing my fingers the mass won't have to count. I have one, two, three, four unknowns, and I have one, two, three equations. Three equations and four unknowns, uh, as you may have noticed at some point in your life, is not enough to solve for the unknowns. So I'm kind of stuck. Here's what I'm going to do. Um, Space-wise, uh, I'm going to keep these free body diagrams here because I want to point back at them later. And I, I, the visuals are my thing in physics. I love visuals, so I'm going to keep these here. I'm going to erase this stuff because we've used it. We've extracted the pieces we needed from Newton's second law of components. So I'm going to erase this and work and do work over here again. Okay, good. So got that. Uh, all right. So I've got three equations. I've got four unknowns. How could I solve this? How could I solve this problem? Well, the answer is there's one more constraint I need to use, one more fact that I need to use in this, and that is that these two masses are connected by a single rope 
with a frictionless pulley in between, the tension at the two ends of a rope is always the same. The magnitude of the tension at the two ends of the rope is always the same. This isn't quite Newton's third law. Newton's third law is always between equal and opposite forces, and here we have forces where one tension force is upward and one is at an angle up the slope. Those are clearly not third law partners, but that's what ropes do, ropes and pulleys. They, ropes and pulleys let us transmit forces from one place to another and change their direction. That, that's the essence of what ropes and pulleys do. If I wanted to be really thorough, I would draw a free body diagram for the pulley, and I'd have some forces here, and I'd have some things. I, there's stuff I could do to make this work. It, it's a pain. Uh, don't worry about it. We're going, to, we're going to just use the known fact that the whole point of a rope and, mass, and a massless, massless rope and massless pulley is the tensions on the two ends will be the same. So, okay, that tells me uh, that tensions... Uh, tension is equal at both ends. So, in particular, that tells me that the magnitude of the force of tension on the little mass has to equal the magnitude of the force of tension on the big mass. And maybe, maybe I can just call both of those magnitude of the force of tension or something. Uh, no, that's kind of a fib. But uh, well, I'll, I, I, I know what it is anyway. I know, I know this magnitude is equal. I'll just use one of them as my, as my variable. So this is a fourth equation. And there are no new unknowns. The same unknowns that I had earlier. Four equations and four unknowns. Hey, I can write that down. Four equations in four unknowns. The physics is done. All that's left is algebra. Well, okay, we have a comparison step at the end, uh, almost. There's a comparison we still need to do at the end, but mostly all we have left is algebra at this point. We still have to do the algebra. We'll go through it. So, okay, what am I solving for in the end? I remember my goal was to solve for the magnitude of the force of static friction. I've got these other things that tell me that, uh, uh, let's see, I've got these other, I've got these other equations uh, solving for force of static friction, I need a, there's an unknown tension here, but that's equal to this unknown tension, so I can just set those equal and plug this one, the, the little m1, into the big m1. Uh, okay, what's that tell me? My equation, my second equation down there, becomes, uh, if I put mg, uh, little mg, in for that tension force, that tells me that minus little m magnitude of g plus zero plus the magnitude of the static friction force plus big M magnitude of G sine of theta equals zero. And in this equation, finally, I'm to the point where I only have one, well, I guess the masses are unknowns, but apart from the masses being unknowns, I only have one, uh, I'm crossing my fingers, the masses will go away, uh, I only have one real unknown left in this problem, and uh, Okay, this is a fifth two, I guess. But I only have one real unknown left in this problem, my force of static friction. I can solve for that. Let me just do that really quick. And I'm going to write big M as three little m just to sort of get that. Well, no, I won't do that yet. I'll keep that. I'll, I won't do too many steps at once. Force of static friction. My force of static friction magnitude is equal to mass times the magnitude of G minus big M magnitude of G sine of theta. Okay, let me look at this really quick just to see if it's reasonable. The heavier the hanging mass is, the bigger the static friction force has to be to keep it from slipping. Yeah, that makes sense. Bigger pull here means bigger pull up, which means I have to resist more. The bigger the, the, bigger the, the slope mass is, that means the lower the static friction force would have to be to keep it from slipping up. Yeah, if this is heavier, it's going to not go up as easily, so it's, that makes sense. Cool. Okay, and I want to know, at this point, my goal is, remember, I've, I've got this. I want to know, is this less than or equal to mu times Fn? So I want to know, is, uh, we're going to put this, I, I want to check, is magnitude of static friction less than or equal to mu static times magnitude of normal force? Well, hey, I even know what that is, right? Uh, that is, 
uh, there's not going to be room there. So this is mu static times big M times the magnitude of G times, I knew there wasn't room, cosine of theta as my right hand side. So is that, is, is this less than or equal to that? Let me check. I didn't need to plug that in here. I'm just going to write this down. I'm going to say is, oh, I can collect some like terms. I, I'm really tempted to collect like terms eventually. We'll see what we have. So we have, um, so I have here, force of static friction is little m magnitude of g minus big M magnitude of g sine theta. And I want to know, is it less than or equal to mu s big M magnitude of g cosine theta? That's my question I want to answer. And at this point, hey, I can probably do some stuff, right? I can do some things. I know my big M is just 3 little m, 3 little m. I know that. And all the terms in this equation have g, magnitude of g in them. So those are going to cancel out. Magnitude of g, magnitude of g, magnitude of g will cancel out. And my little m's, if I divide both sides by little m, that's going to cancel out too. Let, let me see where this takes me. Let me, let me come over. I'm going to leave the free body diagrams there because I want to refer back to them. The curses of a small board, right? Um, so I'm going to come over here. I'm going to do this. I'm going to divide both sides by little m and see what I come up with. Uh, that first term, dividing it by little m, just gives me a 1. So 1 minus, and the 3m over little m is just 3, 3 sine theta less than or equal to um, mu s times 3 when I divide by little m. So 3 mu s cosine theta. Um, right. Uh, this is the part where I suddenly realized that I should have said something else along the way. Okay, but we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, we, we got this story. Um, I get to this, and what do I have here? I, uh, I, when I look at this, the, I can plug in numbers for these things, because sine of theta is sine of 30 degrees, and I happen to know the sine of 30 degrees is 1 half. Cosine of theta is square root of 3 over 2, and so 1 minus 3 halves, this whole side is negative one-half. That should strike you as odd. We'll, we'll engage with that in one second. This side over here is more of a mess. 3 times 0 0.53 times the square root of 3 over 2. Um, you know what? I just want to figure out what that is. Let me do a quick little calculation here uh, just to have the number. 3 times 0.53 times square root of 3 divided by 2. 1.38 is what I come up with. So this whole thing is 1.38. So right off the bat, my impression is that my left-hand side, 1 minus 3 halves, my left-hand side appears to give me a negative 1 half, and I want to know is that less than 1.38. Uh, it, the answer is going to be yes, but the negative sign, I need to understand that negative sign before I, under, before I do anything else. Because a minus sign here is a problem because that came from the magnitude of the force of static friction. And magnitudes aren't negative. So what's going on with that? Let me look back at this equation. Let me look back. Uh, we've copied the important parts of this down, so I'm going to get rid of it. Let me look back at this equation for the force of static friction. What do I have here? My force of, uh, the right-hand side big M is 3 little m, so this was equal to little m g minus 3 little m g times the sine of 30 degrees, which we know was 1 half. And so this whole thing is mg minus 3 halves mg, so minus 1 half m magnitude of g. That's what I would come up with for my stat force of static friction. And that's the magnitude, and it's negative. Uh, I got that point here, and I have to stop and think about it, because it should not be negative. What's, that, what's it telling me when I get a negative sign there? It's actually not a problem. Remember how we guessed at the direction of the force of static friction back here? We guessed that it was down the slope? 
If you get a negative sign for a magnitude of a force from a free body diagram, that just means you guessed wrong, that your force must go the other way. And if that's a problem, you have to figure it out. If a normal force goes the other way, you have a problem. Static friction, it can go the other way. So this just tells me my force of static friction was actually up the slope. It tells me that. The minus sign is just telling me that. So the magnitude of this force is positive that. I should really have absolute value signs around this just in case of that sort of scenario. So the positive one half is the magnitude of the force of static friction I wind up with here. And hey, one half is less than 1.38. That's my whole story. So it does not slip. But if it were going to slip, if I suddenly poured oil on here so it was no longer had friction, if I did that, if it were going to slip, it turns out all I would need to do to interpret this is to say, oh, my static friction force was was acting in this direction. In fact, that means if, there, if that friction force weren't there, that would mean the whole thing would slide this way. If it weren't for that friction holding it up, it, the big block would slide down the slope and the little mass would slide up. So that's how I interpret this. I know it doesn't slip, but if it were going to slip, if I, if I got rid of that static friction, it would be slipping down the hill, not up the hill, because of that negative sign. So to touch base on this, to take stock of what we just did, the strategy of this problem was for a does it slip problem, we assume it doesn't slip. That means our accelerations are typically, well, in this case, our accelerations are zero. If, this, if the surface isn't moving, then the acceleration will be zero. Otherwise, you're just accelerating with the surface. So we said accelerations were zero. We drew free body diagrams for all the pieces of the system. We wrote down Newton's second law and components for each free body diagram. Our extra piece of information was that the tension is equal at both ends of a massless rope, even if it goes around a massless, frictionless pulley. And then it was just algebra to do this comparison, to get to our comparison here. And there's a little extra interpretation to do for that minus sign. We need to be careful with that. But that's our answer. That's how we come up with, uh, how, that's how we come up with an answer to the question of does it slip. And that's how this problem works. I hope that, uh, that that's given you a sense of how to solve not just friction problems, but interacting object problems in general. And I'll hopefully talk to you again.